There were a lot of questions and texts about the chakras. So I really appreciate when you guys pick out topics um, and I don't have to. So the chakras are energy centers and they are often depicted as balls of energy within the body. They're energetic discs sometimes and some of them are flat and spinning. Some of them are shaped, you know, like a flying saucer and spinning. Chakra means turning or spinning. Um, they're vortexes of energy. The popular chakra list is of seven. And Krishnamacharya said, seven is popular now, three have gone out of fashion. And he had 10. So I have both of those lists. Um, another thing is the chakras reside on a tube of energy. And sometimes the chakras are also depicted often, often, often as lotuses, lotus flowers that kind of, there, that kind of does it, go up. And each lotus flower is pierced by an energetic channel called Sushumna. So in order to study the chakras, um, we have to start with the nadis, I think. The nadis are energetic tubes. There's actually, nadi actually just means a tube within the body. So the subtle nadis are energetic nadis, and then the gross nadis are things like arteries, veins, um, the throat, the air passages. Anyway, nadi means tube. The nadis we are talking about, sushumna, is the biggest nadi in the body. And it's about as big around as a silver dollar. It runs from Muladhara chakra. I'm gonna give you a list of a lot of things and trivia and it's super cool and I will be contradicting myself. So Nadi is an, or, uh, Sushumna Nadi is an energetic channel that runs from the base of the spine and the root chakra, Muladhara chakra up to the top of the head. Um, and Sarasrara chakra. And it pierces each of the seven chakras. Sushumna Nadi is the main energetic channel and it's the largest energetic channel. Spinning around it are Ida and Pingala. And they spin around Sushumna and then they pierce the third eye chakra and exit out the opposite nostril. So Ida and Pingala, are spinning around. It's like Ida and Pingala are like a double helix. And if you take, have you seen those um, wind, I don't even know what they are, wind decorations where it's usually a piece of plastic, maybe glass, and it's twisted. And when the wind blows it, it looks like it's really moving, but of course it's just twisted. So it's an optical illusion that outside rim of that twisty wind toy, that's like Ida and Pingala. So sometimes you see pictures of the chakras, which are artists' renderings. They're not actually pictures. Here's one where Ida and Pingala are on the outside of Sushumna. So as they circle around Sushumna, they're just twisted a little bit. So it looks like they go around the outside of the chakras. I don't have my mirroring turned on on my Zoom. Um, so sometimes you see Ida and Pingala going around and then sometimes you see them crossing right at the chakra. And I've read, I've even read, I do not believe this is true. I've even read that where they cross um, sets off the spinning of the vortex and that creates a chakra. And it's like, I don't think so because it just depends on where your vantage point is on where it looks like they're going to be crossing. So here's a good picture of the seven chakras. And this is one of my favorite chakra maps. Um, I'll show you the other photo in, or the other drawing in just a second. So one idea, here's another, I'll give you guys the names of the books and everything at the end. Um, 
Here's another one. And this also has Ida and Pingala actually going around the outsides of the chakras. So that's nice. Um, sometimes Sushumna is seen as a nadi that goes from the base of the spine to the very top of the head. Sometimes it goes beyond the top of the head. I've seen pictures where Sushumna Nadi is anchored into the center of the earth and then out into the center of the universe. They're all cool. All of the paintings and all of the ideas around this are amazing. And they give us an idea. All of these are really just launch pads for you to create your own energetic map. Sorry to jump ahead. That's the end of the lecture. Um, okay, so Sushumna, sometimes it's a straight line and it ends at the top of the head. Sometimes, da, 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 it splits at the back of the skull and then one part of it comes to the third eye, one part of it comes to the crown chakra. In this map, this is my favorite map of Sushumna. In this map, um, Sushumna goes from, the crown chakra is actually kind of like where I have my ponytail. The crown chakra is back a little bit. It's not directly on the very top of the head. It's back a little bit. Here's the third eye chakra. Sushumna comes up in between my two fingers, right behind the jaw, splits and goes to here. In between my two fingers, which would be my brain, in between my two fingers are four energetic lines. One of them is the continuation of Sushumna. And the reason that I really love this map is because we all think that we are so individualized and we think that we can lie and we think that we can be tricky. And I mean, we are tricky and we do lie. And I'm not trying to include you in that. I'm tricky and I lie. And um, anyway, I feel like Sushumna looping through the head is what causes the feeling of isolation and individualism that we get during Kali Yuga. So that's how come I believe this map more than the other maps. Okay, but I don't care, totally don't care how you map yourself out. I would love to hear about it, honestly. Okay, so there's four lines of energy running between these two chakras. One is Sushumna, so that it creates a loop. Another one is um, Satya Yuga, Tam, uh, not Yuga, Satya, Sattva Guna, sorry, Yana. <laughs> this is so funny. I haven't talked to anyone in two years. No, I have, but not about this. Okay, so you know the gunas out in the universe? Okay, so you know in Ayurveda how we're made up of three doshas. The three doshas are vata, pitta, and kapha. The three doshas of the universe are called gunas, and the three gunas are rajas, tamas, and sattva. So sattvic energy is very, very, very... Uh, pure energy. And you, total tangent, milk baba only drank milk or buttermilk or water for 28 years. And that's what he lived off of because it was such the highest, highest. Milk is a complete food. It's the highest form of food, milk, and then honey is the next highest. Milk because it has everything you need to live and no life is taken. It's actually... Um, given as extra when things arrive here on earth, mammals. Okay, so anyway, the other three energetic lines running between these two chakras are the three gunas and that we would have total, like the total purest, purest energy running through our brain. I think that's super exciting. So I like this map for that reason also. Um, and this map that I'm talking about is out of the Ashtanga Yoga Primer by Baba Hari Das. And here's a picture of the skull with Sushumna and the three, the three gunas running through the brain, the nadis that carry those three amazing, most pure types of energy.
And the three gunas are what every single thing in the whole entire universe is made out of. So that we would have those three types of energy running through, you know, through here. I think that's incredible. Okay, so that's one map. Another map is, I'll talk about for a second, it's like being, we are just a bead on a string. And the string goes from the center of the earth out through the up through the seven chakras or whatever. And sometimes in that map, there's another eighth chakra above the head and a ninth above that. And then the 10th, like no one gets to it until we're on our way out of our body. And Sashumna goes to the center of the universe. And that is um, when Sashumna is drawn as being very, very kind of straight. And it just runs through the whole body and we are put together around it. Um, that's a cool map. It's totally fine. Okay, so let's see, where are we? Ida and Pingala are about the size of a quarter and they circle Sushumna. Kundalini rising, Kundalini. Uh, Kundalini is, you know how we have this element on our planet called water? I don't know if you can see right now. It's snowing outside. I don't think you can quite see. Anyway, right now there's frozen water outside. There, if I sit way back, you might be able to see the snow. So water can be, um, now they think there's four forms of water. So anyway, there's definitely three forms of water, vapor, steam, uh, liquid, what we usually call water, and solid, snow or ice. And um, I don't even know what I was talking about. That's so funny. Um, water. Anyway, it'll come back to me. The maps of the chakras, the nadis. Oh, kundalini yoga. Okay, so kundalini is a type of energy that just has a name. It's really prana. And kundalini is in a bulb, a fleshy bulb at the base of the spine and it has like dormant energy. It's kind of like we have Lake Champlain. It's just the name of some water. It's just the name of some prana. But because it's a little reservoir, we name it. So Kundalini is prana that has gathered and pooled in a certain area. And some people think, I have been taught at one point, that Ida and Pingala circling around Sashumna actually squeeze into Sushumna and then there's Sushumna and Ida and Pingala and that causes like this there's too much energy in there so it shoots up through the top of Sushumna and that that's Kundalini rising. Um, Shaktipat is when energy happens quickly when energy is transferred very very quickly and it's usually from one person who has very open channels also just like we can exercise our muscles or we can you know stretch our stretch our body uh you kind of get good at what you practice so this whole energy thing hopefully you can end up creating your own map and your own understanding of it within you that's really the highest highest idea around any of the nadis or chakras and what else was i going to tell you it's really hard to just talk to myself into this computer, even though I love the topic. Um, okay, so, uh, Ida and Pingala, Sushumna, everyone gathers into Sushumna, Kundalini rising. Oh, so the nadis, okay, this is cool. The nadis are actually made up just like the arteries and veins of three layers of energy. So to make these energetic channels, there's actually structure around them, energetic structure. It, it's vibrating more densely than the energy inside. So there's three layers of energy. And the other cool thing is there is three layers of, um, it's like a filter between consciousness and nature, between um, um, vibration and and form or between 
energy and matter. There's this little filter that has three layers. And of course, every layer has a name, which I don't know. And the same thing with around the outside edges of the nadis. Every layer has a name. I don't remember it. Um, so these nadis that have this structure, if we continue to move energy through them, they actually get bigger because they get used to handling more energy. And the way to move that energy through them is through pranayama. Um, I'm sure there's a million ways to do it. Pranayama is the most recommended in all of the yoga books. So, okay, so there is the seven chakra system and every chakra has a bija mantra, that's kind of cool. And then also every petal of every chakra has a bija mantra. And I don't think I ended up grabbing a book. Oh, I just opened to this. I think it's the same as the picture on the front of the book, but it's in black and white. So every chakra has, you can see that they have drawn the lotuses. The lotuses are facing us rather than facing up. And that's so that we can see them and understand them. But really the lotuses are facing up. And each chakra has a certain number of petals. The crown chakra has a thousand petals. Um, some people say it has an infinite number of petals. And the bija mantras of the petals are the Sanskrit alphabet. So just chanting the Sanskrit alphabet is energetically incredibly healthy, healthy for our, for our body. And um, all of the other chakras leading up to the crown chakra, their petal mantras create the alphabet. And then once you get to the crown chakra, it's the alphabet over and over and over and over. So I always thought that I would end up chanting the Sanskrit alphabet every day. And I still might end up doing that, but not right now. So, um, okay, so the root chakra on the seven chakra system, the root chakra is called Muladhara chakra. Mula means root. Muladhara chakra is the root chakra. It's, there's a whole list. So this book by Harish Johari, Chakras, Energy Centers of Transformation. This book for every single chakra, I'm not gonna go through all of these today has a list about the name, the meaning of the names, the location, the element, the center of the, or the color of the element, the yantra or the shape, the bija mantra. Anyway, it goes on and on. It has the stone, it has the ruling planet, um, the sense organ, the aspects, the work organ, the vayu or the prana, the plane or the loka, the color of the petals, the number of the petals, the seed sounds of the petals. Anyway, I feel like every chakra is like an entire planet. And the whole chakra system is like the universe. Like to me, it's almost too much information. Well, to me, it is too much information, but I like the information I know about it. So the sh seven chakra system, it's Muladhara chakra, Svadhisthana chakra, Manipura chakra, Anahata chakra, Vishuddha chakra, Ajna chakra, Sarasrara chakra. So again, root chakra, Muladhara chakra, the color is usually red. Svadhisthana chakra, um, that's around the organs of reproduction and the color is usually orange. Manipura chakra is usually represented by fire and the color is yellow. Anahata chakra is the heart chakra. It, it used to be called the lung chakra, and then it was the lung and heart chakra, and now it's mostly known as the heart chakra. Anyway, um, the color is green. The throat chakra is Vishuddha chakra. The color is blue. Ajna chakra, the color is indigo. Um, sometimes it's a different color, but it's usually indigo, and that's the third eye. And then Sarasrara chakra is the crown chakra, and you will see it as silver, gold, pure white, um, many, many lotus petals. So that's the seven chakra system or the names and each, each chakra. I mean, there are really thick, thick books written on the chakras and some of them uh, really go into psychology and 
emotions and and like family history and i haven't read them because they have too many words in them and then my love krishna macharya in the yoga makaranda he's like yeah there's seven chakras and he lists all of them and he talks about them really really simply there this book is available in a pdf version um on patreon and on our patreon and um anyway this is if i could only have one yoga book this is the yoga book i would have luckily i have 400 yoga books so anyway he goes into a description of the seven chakras and then he includes the other three so in his chakra system there are 10 chakras even though he's saying they that there doesn't need to be any longer so muladhara chakra svanistana chakra manipura chakra and then there's manipura is a little bit lower and then there's surya chakra so usually manipura chakra is right at the where the rib cage comes together and the solar plexus. And when we have the bandhas on, this is the area that gets heated. And this is the area that is kind of the fight between the big open rib cage and the super strong lower belly. And this part is like, should I open? Should I be strong? Should I just, I don't know what to do. Well, that's probably not your conversation. That's my conversation. Anyway, um, so in the 10 chakra system, this is called Surya chakra. And then Manas chakra is below the heart, and then Anahata chakra, Vishuddha chakra, Ajna chakra, Sarasrara chakra, and then there is Brahma Guha chakra, which is in the very center. So Sarasrara takes over the whole skull with the thousand, um, with the not the whole skull, but the whole top of the skull with the thousand petals. And at the very top of the head is B-R-A-M-H-A-G-U-H-A, -A -A, Brahma Guha Chakra. So those are the 10. I have a list over there. Um, that's why I'm looking that way. Muladhara Chakra, Svanistana Chakra, Manipura Chakra, Surya Chakra, Manas Chakra, Anahata Chakra. I wrote that when we were still in the studio. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Um, Anahata chakra, Vishuddhi chakra, Ajna chakra, Sarasrara chakra, and Brahma Guha chakra. So those are the 10. Um, what else do I want to say? In the seven, I have not figured out the Bija mantras for all 10 of those. In the seven chakra system, I really, really love the Bija mantras of the you know, seven popular chakras. So Muladhara chakra, the Bija mantra is LAM, L-A-M. Uh, sometimes it's L-A-N-G-H, L-U-N-G-H. And you can hear it in some nice uh, yoga pop music. Sometimes where people are like, LAM, 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 LAM. And that's totally great. I like it the way I learned it the bija mantra for the root chakra goes like this oh. just add on the om when you have run out of being able to make the sound. The second chakra um, around, if you have a uterus around the uterus, is the Vishuddha chakra and the Bija mantra is VAM, V-A-M, V-A-N-U-G-H. There's, you know, there's all different ways. And also the pronunciation is different, whether you're kind of north or south in location. I'm uh, west east west in location anyway vom and it sounds like this that rumbling uh 
Tibetan-ish throat chanting, tuva singing, uh, um, rocky sound that sometimes comes out that's promoted in, when I learned these. So Lam, Vam, the third chakra is Ram, R-A-M, Rong, uh, Rong. So it's just the sound of R. Go ahead and inhale. And the heart and lung chakra, Anahata chakra, the Vijra mantra is Yam, Y A M. And the Vishuddha chakra, the throat chakra, the Bija mantra is hum, H-A-M. And it sounds like this. And I hope my computer will allow you to hear this. The third eye chakra, we'll come back to that. The third eye chakra, the mantra is Om. And it's out loud, so it sounds like this. And then the crown chakra, the mantra is Om, the Bija mantra is Om, and it's silent. So you just inhale and silently Om. I love them. Uh, Bija mantra is for the seven chakras. So it's Lam, Vam, Ram, Yam. And it goes from tongue behind the teeth and very physical. Oh, that's also one of the positions for Ujjayi. Before you learn Kachari Mudra, the original position is the tongue touches behind the teeth. And just touching your tongue to the backs of the front teeth or the roots of the front teeth is supposed to activate Mula Bandha. Not enough for me because I'm made of granite. However, there, I, you know, I have read that. Um, <laughs> so the tongue placement behind the teeth for the L sound is um, really good. And then Lam, Vam, Ram, Yam, those are all pretty physical. The, sound if you say yellow and then you try to keep that sound of the Y. The tongue is kind of floating in the mouth and it 
but it has to hold still. Like there's still structure to it because the tongue has to hold still in order to make that sound of the Y. And then when we get to the throat chakra, um, it all kind of fell apart for me for the first number of years because I was letting out too much air. And that Bija mantra is still not the length of any of the other Bija mantras that are easier for me. And I think most people. So it's the sound of H. It's like whispering. It's almost like Ujjayi Pranayama, but instead of Ujjayi Pranayama that you want to be able to maintain, you know, through vinyasas and jumping open and an hour and a half of practice or whatever, an hour of practice, um, it's like the smallest amount of air where you can maintain a consistent H sound. And then the volume comes on to end it in the om or om or whatever at the end. So I'm gonna do that one one more time. It goes like this. I doubt if we can hear that on the recording, but anyway, it's the sound of H. And then OM, you know, that one starts and ends so many different practices that we do. It's such a common um, mantra that we are all probably already pretty good at it because we've practiced it. And then silent OM for the top of the head, for me, it's getting better. It's getting better. But my thoughts can happen so quickly that sometimes I'm like, om, om, om. Where am I in the om? Om. Like my thoughts, it, it's, it's more difficult for me to lean onto it because there is not the physicality of it that there is in the other Bija mantras. Anyway, that's kind of my personal experience. Um, being in a human body, I assume it's a probably pretty common experience. I have met someone once who said that the easiest Bija mantra was the silent om for the crown chakra. And I thought, okay, let me in with you. Let's do it again. But I couldn't figure out how to do that. Okay, so the seven chakras and their Bija mantras, totally love them. Lam, Vam, Ram, Yam, Ham, Om, silent om. And then after you would do those, you would practice those. We're not going to do it because this video would be eight hours long. Um, but you would practice those like three or four times each. So lam for a long time, lam for a long time, you know, like the full version, three or four times each. And then at the end, they loop together like this. It goes, oh. Oh. And after the silent om, you inhale again. Oh. And then inhale again. So if you practice each Bija mantra three times, then do that three times. If you practiced each Bija mantra 18 times, then do that 18 times. Um, it's, uh, I don't know what it is. I don't know what any of this is, but it's fun. And I like doing that. And also it really makes me um, very conscious of how how smooth I can get through those sounds so it all becomes one uh, one thing that's happening kind of in here. Okay, so we covered the 10 chakra system. We covered the idea that Sushumna can go straight out the top of the head. We covered the seven chakra system with the Bija mantras. And we also covered 
the idea that Sushumna is a looped system within the head. That seems pretty good. The nadis are part of the chakra system and the nadis I think have become less popular and the chakras have somehow become more popular. Um, I don't know why. So the nadis in Krishnamacharya's book uh, I'm going to read for a second. Just above the genital organs and below the navel, there is a lump of flesh like the egg of a bird called the Kanda Stana. 72,000 nadis, which reach all parts of the body, sprout from this junction. Among these, 10 nadis are considered very important. They are Ida, Pingala, Sashumna, Gandhari, Hastajiva, Pusha, Yasavini, Alambusha, Kuhu, and Shankini. All the other nadis have their roots in the above 10, and hence these 10 are known as root nadis or mula nadis. And I'm going to go over this twice. Um, once through Krishnamacharya's list, and then once through a list I have on my phone. Ida extends up to the left nostril, while Pingala reaches the right nostril. Sashumna runs between them and rises all the way to the crown of the head. Gandhari reaches the left eye, while Hastajiva reaches the right eye. Pusha terminates in the right ear, while Yashavini, Yashavini um, terminates in the left ear. Alambusha reaches the forehead, Kuhu to the genital organs, and Shankini to the Muladhara chakra. And this is in his section on, what is this section on? This is in chapter three. And then his description of the chakras is in chapter two, and it's under pranayama or it's listed with pranayama. So the 10 root nadis, right? Sushumna and Ida and Pingala seem to be the most popular. They're in most of these depictions around, you know, the chakras and, and honestly, I didn't come across them until recently. And then this next list, um, Maria found and passed on to us. And this is from hridayayoga.com, H-R-I-D-A-Y-A dash yoga.com, hridayayoga.com. And they're called the Manova Nadis or the 10 gates. In Tantra yoga, the Manova Nadis are the 10 main energy channels. They are known as the 10 gates as it is believed that at death, the jivatman or soul and the vital energy abandon the physical body through one of these gates. The 10 main nadis are Sushumna, Ida, Pingala, Gandhari, Hastajiva, Yashvini, Pusha, Alambusha, Kuhu, and Shankini. Traditional yogic texts like the Siddha Siddhanta Parati and Darshana Upanishad and the Yoga Yash. Yajna Valyakya, uh, Yajna Valyakya, <laughs> that isn't it, but I have it on my shelf. Um, refer to these energy channels, however, they sometimes describe their paths in slightly different ways. So there's a few like sources and, and they're saying that the information is also, uh, it varies. It's not conflicting, it just varies. Number one, Sushumna Nadi. Sushumna Nadi is considered the most gracious energy channel. It is the natural energy channel that passes through the spine in the subtle body. It begins in Muladhara Chakra and goes along the middle of the subtle spine to the Brahmanara, Brahman, Brahmanarananda, Brahman, Brahma Guha is what Krishnamacharya calls it. They're calling it Brahman Ranandara at the crown of the head. 
In yoga, we endeavor to make prana, life force energy, run in Sushumna Nadi, which is also known as Brahma Nadi. When energy flows predominantly through Sushumna for long periods of time, we become dead to the world. That isn't really what I thought we were going to become. We're going to become that anyway. We're definitely going to become that. It's kind of a guarantee for enlightenment, right? Um, sorry. Okay, hold on. I'll just read. Uh, we become dead. When energy flows predominantly through Sushumna for long periods of time, we become dead to the world and enter into samadhi. Symbolically, sushumna is associated with the fire element and is considered sattvic or harmonious in nature. Ida nadi. Ida nadi means comfort energy channel. It is passive feminine yin energy in the subtle body. It lies to the left of sushumna nadi and its energy is complementary to that of pingala. Ida Nadi also is known as Chandra Nadi. It begins at a subtle level and Muladhara Chakra goes along the back of the left side of the spine and intersects with Pingala Nadi in the Ajna Chakra, the coordinator of polarity. The color white is used to re represent the subtle vibrational quality of Ida Nadi. Symbolically, it is associated with the moon as, and is considered tamasic or inert in nature. Pingala Nadi, also known as Surya Nadi. It is called the Tawny Energy Channel. It is masculine active yang energy in the subtle body. It lies to the right of Sushumna Nadi and its energy is complementary to that of Ida. The vibrational quality of Pingala Nadi is represented by the color red. Symbolically, it is associated with the sun and it is considered rajasic or dynamic in nature. So that actually kind of explains why Sushumna and Ida and Pingala are the most popular in my mind that explains it because they cover the qualities of the three gunas. And I am mixing all kinds of information up together here. Um, this is the only book or yeah, this is the only place I've ever seen this that has the three gunas going through our head. So maybe in other traditions, um, Ida, Pingala, and Sushumna are the most important because they have the qualities of those three gunas. Okay, I'm going to keep reading. Because um, right now we're trying to talk about the 10, uh, the 10 main nadis in the body. Number four. <laughs> Gandhari Nadi. Gandhari Nadi flows from below the corner of the left eye to the, kunda, to the kanda, the energetic bulb in the abdominal area, and ends in the big toe of the left foot. Gandhari Nadi flows from the below the left corner of the left eye. So right here. I'm going to say it's right here. Um, to the left big toe. It is said to carry psychic energy from the lower part of the body, starting from the big toe, to the Ajna chakra. Gandhari is situated behind Ida Nadi and has similar functions. Its complementary structure is Hastajiva Nadi. Number five, Hastajiva Nadi. Hastajiva Nadi means elephant tongued energy channel. It flows from below the corner of the right eye to the kanda and ends in the big toe of the right foot. Hastajiva is said to carry psychic energy from the lower part of the body, starting at the big toe, to the ajna chakra. Its complementary structure is Gandhari Nadi. So Gandhari Nadi is left eye to the left big toe passing through kanda. And then Hastajiva Nadi is right eye passing through the Kanda to the right big toe. Number six, Yashvini Nadi. Yashvini Nadi is splendid energy channel. It flows from the right big toe to the Kanda and ends at the left ear. So it crosses. Its complementary structure is Pusha Nadi. Number seven, Pusha Nadi. Pushanadi, the nourishing energy channel, flows from the left big toe to the kanda and ends at the right ear. 
Its complementary structure is Yashvini Nadi. Um, so it's cool that those cross. I'm sure that that's really important somehow, maybe just to keep us in our human form. I don't know, but I really love this. I really love this information, even though I don't know what to do with it. Alan Bushanadi. Alan Bushanadi is considered the very misty energy channel. It begins at the anus, goes through the khanda, and ends in the mouth. Kuhunadi. Kuhunadi is the new moon energy channel. It begins in the throat and ends in the genitals. In tantric practices for sublimating sexual energy, the bindu or the essence rises from the genital area to the soma chakra. Thus, the practitioner becomes an urdhva retas, a tantric, a tantric who can sublimate sexual energy into spiritual energy. Uh, number 10, Shankini Nadi. Shankini Nadi is the mother of pearl energy channel. It, origin, it originates in the throat and ends in the anus. Its energy flows between Sarasvati Nadi and Gandhari Nadi on the left side of Sushumna Nadi. Ashvini Mudra, uh, conscious contraction of the anus, is a way of activating this Nadi. So, Like everything I learn, I feel like, you know, you're give, I'm given a little tidbit and a little tidbit. And now I'm given a lot of tidbits and this list that I was reading off my phone. Okay, question, question number one that I have. If this is the first, for most of us that have been hanging around the studio for the past, whatever, infinity, and on Zoom in our little dollhouses, our, our dollhouse for like, what, two years, uh, most of this is review. So you kind of already know what I've been thinking about and whether I've been contemplating it or joking about it. And, um, and you know that I don't really know anything, but I do like, I like it. I really like it. So here are my questions. Number 10. Anyway, if this is the first time you've been introduced to this, I'm sorry, it's a little bit chaos and not being that organized, but it all kind of meshes together because I didn't have just one teacher. I didn't have just one source of information. Okay, so here's the question. Number 10, Shankini Nadi, it mentions Sarasvati Nadi. That's a Nadi that no one has ever mentioned to me before, and I don't know what it means. I don't know what most of these mean, so I guess it doesn't really matter. And then the other question I had was, elephant tongued energy channel is the Hasta Jiva Nadi. The Gandhari Nadi from the corner of the left eye, Hasta Jiva is the corner of the right eye. Um, the Gandhari Nadi, does it have, you know how everything has like a elephant tongued energy channel or splendid energy channel, nourishing energy channel? I don't see a name associated or a translation associated with the Gandhari Nadi. Yeah, it doesn't mention a name. It does for Sushumna, Ida, Pingala, Hastajiva. Maybe it just got left out somewhere. So that's another question I have about this list. And this list, um, it looks like this if you ever look it up the 10 main energy channels and they have lightning. <laughs> anyway, um, let's see, chakras. Oh, here's some more. There are chakras in your hands. There are chakras in your feet. When we stand together in Samastetihi, some people think there are four chakras in the feet. And some people think there's only two chakras in the feet. And when we bring our feet together and we stand with our feet together, they all come together and then that becomes the largest chakra in the body. So when we stand in samastatihi and people are like, oh, let it be grounding, uh, I think it might actually be grounding, which is great. Language worked maybe in that situation. Okay, and then another thing is uh, every time, so these nadis, um, 
I don't think I brought a picture of what I think the naughties look like. The, have you seen a drawing of the nervous system? And the naughty map looks to me almost identical to the nervous system, even though I don't think it's exactly the same thing. So every time a naughty um, is a certain, certain thickness and then it divides into another naughty and those fork off and divide and those fork off and divide, every single opening of that uh, channel, that little spot, there's a vortex. There are so many chakras in the body, we're only talking about the ones that are the most popular, the most common, and the largest, usually the largest. Um, anyway, there's so many chakras in the body because the chakra is like a little spinning disc or a vortex of energy. And they happen at every joint, they happen at the elbows. They also happen, um, I don't know, more. They happen more. That's how good I am with the chakras. <laughs> um, anyway, I do like that people have spent time um, thinking about the subtle body and thinking about the energetic body. Another thing that I think is really cool, and I don't know the name for it, is when we have a drishti, like if your drishti in, just in triangle, my drishti in open triangle, my drishti is my top hand in rotated triangle. I can't always reach it, but you know, then my drishti is a ceiling. Anyway, the most fiery line of energy that we have, like, like um, fiery, uh, that's all I can come up with. The fieriest line of energy we have is out of our eyes. So our eyesight is a very, very powerful um, naughty and we place it in different places. And there was some study done, sorry, I, that's all I know. There was some study done where people thought they were attending a study of a certain thing and, and they were filling out a questionnaire and people would walk into the room and look at them. And there was a huge percentage, I know this is vague, but it's still good. Um, there was a huge percentage of people that when they were being looked at, they would turn around and make eye contact with the person who was looking at them. And the study was actually about, do, you, do people sense when someone is looking at them? Like, do you just turn around because you hear someone enter the room? Or do you actually turn around when you're focused on something because you feel them looking at you? And very specific people turned around depending on who the person was looking at. So apparently we can feel it when people look at us. That's psychic. That's a naughty, that's a trishti. That's some sort of amazing feat. We're so lucky. Any of the senses that we have, we're so lucky. Um, what else? There's a book called Micro Chakras. It's kind of thick. There's supposed to be a CD in the back, but it's a used book. So there's no CD in the back. And honestly, I have not read this. It seems a bit over my head. I would like to read the introduction. Oh yeah, and the guy who wrote this book is friends with this guy. Harish Johari. Harish Johari. And this person's name is Sri Shyamji Shyam Sri Shyamji Bhatnagar. I'd like to memorize that because it feels good in my mouth. Sri Shyamji Bhatnagar. And this is his book. And it's also with David Isaacs. Um, and this is his book on the micro chakras. And uh, this is what I wanted to read. This has smaller print. So we put on the readers plus one. Um, I was born during the intense heat 
of the summer of 1936 in Northwest India. My entrance into the world was nearly fatal, caused by double pneumonia. Since my father was a pr prominent eye surgeon who ran his own hospital and was a physician to the Royal Sultan of Mardan, he was able to arrange the intensive care necessary for my survival. However, my early years were filled with continuous pain due to my weakened lungs. Members of my family were followers of Swami Dayananda, who in 1875 had founded the Hindu reform movement known as Arya Samaji, Samaj, Arya Samaj. These teachings are a modified form of Vedanta. I learned many mantras and practices of the Vedas at home. My mother was a devotee of Gayatri and we often participated in sacred ceremonies. My mother was an extraordinary woman in many ways. I remember, for example, a time when she stopped the funeral arrangements for a baby born four months too soon. She held the dying baby in her hand and chanted the powerful Gayatri mantra for five hours while feeding her water. Strength gradually returned to the baby and she opened her eyes. Today, this baby is a mother of three children. I was amazed at the concentration and faith of my mother in spite of the disbelief of all those around her. In 1947, British rule of the subcontinent terminated and a bloody war broke out between India and the newly partitioned Pakistan. As my family was Hindu, we could no longer live freely in the new Muslim nation of Pakistan. We became exiles from the land of our ancestors and settled in the bustling Indian city of Dehradun, a railroad terminus in the foothills of the Himalayas. When I was nearly 13 years old, I took a train with a group of boys to a nearby village, a favorite pastime of ours. We planned to spend a few hours picking lychee nuts in the countryside and afterward to jump on a slowly moving train to return home. The idea held much excitement for us. On this particular trip, however, because I had picked a few ex extra lychees, I missed the train. The other boys got on the train and laughed at me. I returned to the orchard to wait for the next train. While eating my lychees, I heard an extraordinary sound. It seemed to be coming from every direction in which I turned, yet I could not determine the source. Then a few moments later, I noticed something that I had not seen before. Seated before me on a mound of rock was an extraordinary yogi in full lotus posture, chanting the sacred syllable, Om. He looked like someone from another era, Despite his obvious dexterity, he seemed to be well over a hundred years of age or in some sense, ageless. I walked toward the mound where he was sitting. He had soft glittering eyes and to my astonishment called me by my first name. He also told me the name of my father, my father's father and so on for six generations. He said that I had been his disciple in my previous life and asked me to meet him at the Shiva temple in Dehradun to continue our work. When I returned home, I asked my father to verify the names of our ancestors. He remembered all but two. He got in touch with my grandfather who remembered one more name. The sixth name remains a mystery. My guru imparted a rare oral tradition of sacred sounds, nada yoga, coupled with the science of breath. Shva, Shvarara, Shva, S V A R A, Svara, Svara Yoga. This enabled me to chant with microtones. The brilliance and effectiveness of his teachings were transformative, both spiritually and physically. The pain in my chest gradually disappeared. The grace of the guru and the spiritual practices he imparted are the basis of my life's work and teachings. After I had studied with him for four years, our family moved to another town where I went to college and studied philosophy, comparative religion, and history. In college, I met Harish Johari, 
who was three years my senior. We became best friends. He tutored me in writing poetry and in the study of philosophy. I had the wonderful opportunity of living with him and his family for a full year. In 1960, I migrated to the United States and eventually became a citizen. Initially, I lived in California. It was there I began my work on the relation of sound and consciousness. In 1966, I returned to India for a year to see my family and friends. Harish introduced me to his teacher, Pandant R. Pandey, an Ayurvedic physician with whom we studied together for seven months. Among other things, he taught us mantras used for various medicinal preparations. The three of us decided to create an organization, Satyam Shivam Sandaram, Truth, Goodness, and Beauty, in Bareilly, India. It was dedicated to the purpose of researching the interrelationships of sounds, Ayurveda, mantra, and Western healing modalities. Upon my return from India, I established a branch of this organization in New York City. In 1970, the name was changed to SRI Center International. While still in India on a pilgrimage with Harish high in the Himalayas, I sat outside a temple to meditate. During this meditation, I had an extraordinary vision of my own chakras. That's amazing. Vortices of light emanated throughout my subtle body and illuminated three channels, which fed into the two hemispheres and the lower portion of my brain. I could see photons of various hues radiating from my hands. I felt euphoric. This experience was a prelude to another dramatic occurrence in January of 1967 in my West Village apartment in New York City. What took place at that time was a form of automatic writing. For more than five hours, I was in an unusual state of awareness and wrote continuously. Then I fell asleep on the writing pad. When I awoke and read what I had written, it was a description of 147 micro chakras within the classical seven chakra system. It baffled me. As far as I knew, these subdivisions had never been revealed before. I have spent the rest of my life refining my knowledge of the micro chakras and using this knowledge to help others. Once I became aware of the micro chakras, I noticed that whenever I chanted in microtones, I could feel their pulsation within me. Apparently the years of chanting had prepared me to receive the knowledge revealed in the automatic writing. In addition to chanting, I discovered that I could activate the micro chakras by playing the tambura. Excuse me. This is an ancient stringed instrument that is usually used in India only for the purpose of assisting vocalists and instrumentalists. I developed a way to use it as a solo instrument. At the time I discovered the micro chakras, I was living in a fifth floor walk up. My next door neighbor was an elderly lady who suffered from arthritis. I carried her groceries upstairs. One day she told me that she used to lean against the wall between our apartments at times when I was chanting and playing the tambura. She found the vibrations through the wall relieved the pain of her spinal arthritis. I invited her into my apartment to sit alongside me while I played and chanted. We did this for many sessions. Then I experimented in order to see if any of the energy could travel directly through my hands to the affected area of her spine. When I touched her spine, I could transfer most of the sound energy through my hands, which brought her greater relief. She was my first client. As I worked with others, I realized people found relief from emotional issues as well. Students who regularly received inner tuning demonstrated that their sound sensitivity expanded to the skin level. They could feel the vibrations with their entire body. The benefits of the sound were greatly enhanced. Gradually, I noticed that their egos were becoming more refined and they started to have higher chakra experiences. Their stress levels dramatically reduced. I concluded that I had discovered a system that could help people at the psycho-spiritual level. 
I continue to travel throughout the United States and Europe teaching this system. Along the way, I have frequently taught at Esalon and other growth centers, as well as at various universities. Two well-known parapsychologists, Professor Ten Hoff and Professor Henry von Prague, heard a series of five lectures I delivered at the Royal Tropical Museum in Amsterdam. Professor von Prague had me teach in his newly founded University of Lugano. After 12 years of teaching in the Department of Chakra Studies, I was awarded the title of honorary professor. Kindred Spirit, a prestigious magazine in London, awarded my Heart Chakra CD, which is included inside the back cover of this book, the title of the most inspirational musical album for 2001. Today, many people are interested in, in exploring the inner world and, and transforming their awareness. Advanced thinkers in physics are keen to understand the relationship between quantum reality and the true nature of reality. Many physicians and psychologists are interested in the relationship between subtle energies and health. It is my hope that in this book, it will offer a new perspective and will help them to progress toward their goals. I'm grateful to all my students who have given me the opportunity to serve them and thereby, thereby develop my system. I'm also grateful to my family for their patient help to finish this book. A particular thanks is offered to those volunteers who gave their selfless service, making it possible for my organizations to flourish at home and abroad. I wish to express a special gratitude to Swami Atmana Dendra Saraswati, who refined my knowledge of Vedanta, both through his brilliant discourse and through the purity of his lifestyle. It is my hope that this book will propel many to engage in the greatest adventure ever, spiritual epiphany and self-discovery. That was kind of long. And truth be told, it's the only part of this book I've read so far, but it's so good because he's like, okay, yes, his story sounds amazing. Your story sounds amazing. My story sounds amazing. If I try to put my story into like six paragraphs, I'm sure it'll sound amazing. Um, but, you know, living the story 24 hours a day, it seems really normal and just like life. But the part that I thought was so great is he seems incredibly, uh, blessed, I guess, blessed um, to have run into someone who's like, hey, we studied in a previous life and this happens all the time and that's so cool, let's continue our studies. And then it all kind of came to him and he got to do the spontaneous writing and that worked out to more than just, um, I like Reese's peanut butter cups and which is what my, I don't really like that, but I do like chocolate. That's what my spontaneous writing would say, would say chocolate, chocolate, chocolate 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 um anyway <laughs> so uh but at the end okay i'm really wrapping this up at the end he was saying it's all about self-discovery and that you he was still saying he's like i have a whole book and a cd on the micro chakras i've spent my whole life working on this and you still have to do it yourself have fun so that's cool all right seven chakras, 10 chakras, um, Ashtanga Yoga Primer by Baba Hari Das, Yoga Makaranda by Krishnamacharya, Micro Chakras by Sri Shamaji, I do need to learn to pronounce his name, Sri Shyamji Bhatnagar, Sri Shyamji Bhatnagar, and then also, Harish Johari's book on chakras. And there's so many others. Thank you. Um, Nadi's chakras, I don't think they can really um, be talked about separately. So thanks for coming. Love you. Um,